Hello, everybody, and uh, welcome to this uh, session on uh, prioritizing workplace mental health. Uh, my name is Philip Campbell, and I'm chairing this session. And um, the order of the session will be uh, some brief housekeeping uh, guidelines. We're going to do a quick poll, um, and then we I will introduce the speakers, and we will have a panel discussion. And then we will go into some breakout sessions, and then we'll report back on the breakout. Um, I think the key messages about this session are sharing experiences of how organizations deal with mental health, uh, focusing on approaches that work, uh, so the evidence for those, and also in, indirectly, I guess, guiding the World Economic Forum, because it is itself doing a lot in this area. So um, I believe I'm meant to be uh, making way for some housekeeping. Uh, but if not, I will go on. Someone can send me a message if you want. Um, but uh, the poll that we are meant to be doing um, is uh, that my employer has increased mental health well-being resources for employees this year after COVID-19. Here's the poll on the screen, I hope. And uh, I guess all you need to do is to click on whatever you think is appropriate and submit it and we will get some feedback immediately. So I'm just gonna wait until we get the feedback. So what I'll get on with uh, while we wait for the feedback is to introduce the speakers. So um, we have with us... This uh, meeting is being recorded. I'm just being told this meeting is being recorded. Here we go. Here's the feedback. So the majority, but uh, not necessarily a huge majority, but a majority have taken steps. So we will be, I'm sure, sharing some experiences of that. Um, and for example, um, if you're like me, working from home much more, than you were, um, what impact has that been generally found to have on mental health? And can companies already begin to share experiences about how they cope with that? Okay, so um, let's move on and in, it's, uh, let me um, introduce the speakers. So uh, we have a, um, a very interesting panel of people. We have Professor Miranda Wolpert, who is head of the mental health priority area at the Wellcome Trust. Um, and she's also a professor at University College London. Um, we have Emma Codd, who is the Global Inclusion Leader at Deloitte and the founding partner of the Global Business Initiative on Workplace Mental Health. Emma, it would be great if at some point we can be clear about that initiative because it sounds very interesting. We have Enoch Lee, who is Managing Director and the founder of um, Therapy, a social enterprise for well-being consulting and training to prevent uh, workplace ill health and uh, to strengthen well-being uh, with a special efforts in China and uh, the Asia Pacific region. And then we hope during this meeting, we'll be joined by Fatima Azara El Azuzi, um, who uh, we've had trouble contacting, but um, if she can join us, that'll be great. And uh, she's a member of the World Economic Forum Global Shapers Community and um, a youth mental health advocate. Uh, she works in the IT industry, I believe. So those are our speakers. And uh, without further ado, I think we can uh, begin a discussion um, for the next uh, 30 minutes or so. Um, and the, the questions obviously we're trying to look at are how should businesses be thinking about mental health well-being for their employees? Um, um, and it's certainly interesting in my company that the part of the company that has paid most attention to the mental health and well-being is the same part of the company that deals with other aspects of sustainability. So mental health and well-being is a part of sustainability of a company, no question, but also it is being seen in a wider context. And for example, in the bigger world, the, the issue of climate change is something that we believe is of great relevance to mental health. So the, those issues do join up in that respect too. Then how do we measure the impact of the things we do in our companies and what does success look like? And what role does the employer play? What is their responsibility? And, um, and in particular, how can we make sure that CEOs 
uh, take responsibility because if you have that guidance from the top, that's great. But also, what about the bottom-up initiatives? So those are that's the space we're dealing with. And um, Miranda, Emma, and Enoch, I'll invite you to speak. If Fatima joins us, I'll invite her to speak too. Uh, Miranda, why don't you tell us a little bit about what you're doing and what your interests are in this space? Over to you. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? I'm not muted. Yes. Right. I'm just putting into the chat two links that may be useful to people that if you get bored of listening to me, you can look at these links, which are probably got more interesting stuff anyway. So the, um, thank you very much for inviting me today. I uh, guess welcomes uh, sees mental health uh, as one of its core areas of interest. And one of the things that I think is about sustainability for the whole planet. Um, so really helpful to see it in the context of these wider initiatives, including things like um, climate change and infectious diseases. Um, and uh, we do think that the workplace is one of the key areas, civil society and changing the way that we support mental health in the workplace is going to be one of the key ways that we transform the way that mental health is supported and positive mental health is promoted going forward into the future. So there are two um, things that we want to let you know about. The first is that we have um, a position paper that we have, we're very proud of that have come out of our learning from the COVID crisis, that where we are partnering with the World Economic Forum, the World Health Organization and UNICEF to agree three principles in absolutely everything we do. One is that the voice of lived experience has to be at the heart of everything we do. So anything we're doing around workplace mental health has to essentially draw on people who have experienced mental health difficulties and what will help them and not help them. The second is to look for local innovations and not assume that we can invent everything and then impose it top down. We know there'll be all sorts of things happening from, from small workplaces to large workplaces that we want to learn from and that what works in one place may not work in another. So making sure that we're locally sensitive. And the third, and this I think is, is really our way into workplace mental health, is that if we are going to manage and address the challenge of mental health issues, we're going to have to think wider than health and healthcare. And the workplace is one of the main areas where we need to think. So thinking larger than healthcare when we think about mental health. So those are the three principles that we're committed to. And I put a link into the paper um, if you're interested. The, in terms of our actual initiative around workplace mental health, we've just commissioned 10 um, groups from across the world to look at different innovations in terms of workplace mental health, because our commitment is to bring scientific evidence to bear. And we're interested in working with any workplaces that are interested in doing that. That's why we're so excited by the Global Business Initiative and by uh, One Mind, which is a collaboration of uh, workplaces looking around mental health. It's been going for some years thinking about what the evidence base might be. So our, what we've done is we've commissioned a range of initiatives. They're on our website and I put a link into the chat. They range from group psychological first aid to peer support to mindfulness training, to employee autonomy, to flexible work practices, to reducing prolonged sitting. So they're quite diverse. And we think that reflects the field that we are, we haven't yet, it isn't clear yet where you will get most bang for your buck as a workplace. And one of the things that we are nervous about is there is a lot of selling going on in the space of saying this will solve it just by my app or by my approach. And we're really keen to work with workplaces to get an evidence base in, really keen to develop a methodology where we put science into the workplace. So in order to do that, um, two things we want to alert you to. One is that we have launched an initiative of common metrics in all scientific study of mental health. We want workplaces to use those common metrics as much as healthcare settings. They're on our website. This is a joint initiative with the National Institute of Mental Health in the States. And we're hoping that in time, all funders will uh, support us in this. So if you are looking at mental health in the workplace, we would like you to be using the PHQ measure, the, uh, the GAD measure, or for younger people, there are other measures, but those are the two co core ones that we really want workplace science to use. And we'd like you to be thinking in terms of what are the active ingredients of what really helps in the workplace and thinking broader than healthcare. So that might range from your policies around pay and flexible working right through to your policies around specific sorts of therapies or specific interventions. Miranda. Uh, okay, Miranda, thanks very much indeed. Um, let me just ask a little bit um, about 
what that actually means in terms of what the companies need to do, if you like, to provide. Yeah. Uh, and you're obviously uh, welcome is traditionally very steeped in academia and academics do study these things, but you're talking about other settings and other types of documenting, I imagine. So could you say a little bit more so that the people who are in companies, whether big companies or small, get a better sense of what it is you would need from them? What I would like from them is to join us in the collaboration around trying to get science into what actually helps their employees to so help us learn. So what I want from them is to get involved with scientists and we're happy to broker those relationships. So they actually try, try out different things within their companies, however small, you can still try out something in a rigorous way and see if it works for you. I'd like them to measure what they're doing as part of their uh, processes, whether they're using employee surveys or other methods, and I'd like them to come together in some of the collaborations that already exist, whether it's the Global Business Initiative or One Mind or other collaborations, to actually share learning so that we learn from their local innovation. Okay, and then my second and final question at this point is, uh, how ready are the companies to do what you need? What do you experience? Give us all hope by saying okay, that you're so getting I a lot of buy -in. I would say there's never been a better time that the companies are, are particularly interested in this. I think there's never been a better time to have it on the agenda. I think they are confused about what to do, not, not uh, quite understandably, and they're looking for guidance. I think there is a need to make sure they think broader than the older members of their uh, employees and think to younger members in particular, where I think there are particular issues. And one of the things we're already learning from our reviews so far is how little literature there is on the younger age group. So I think it's about trying to find what works for you within the scale of your company to rigorously investigate what will help with the mental health of your employees and draw on us a resource to help you think about the scientific models that you might use. Thank you very much, Miranda. And now over to Emma. Emma, you work in a big company. You're familiar with the big company landscape, and uh, I'm interested to hear about your perspective on that and anything else you want to highlight for us. Over to you. Thanks, Phil. Um, and um, Miranda, thank you. Um, always great to listen to um, your comments around the role of the workplace as well. So I'm just going to give um, some really brief comments, just tell you a little bit about Deloitte, um, why mental health is um, really one of our primary inclusion priorities um, from a global perspective. So, so Miranda mentioned the the younger um, part of the workforce. And I think that um, that's really important for all organizations to, um, to think about and to consider. So if you take Deloitte as an organization, we have over 300,000 um, employees around the world. We are across multiple locations um, and over 80% of our workforce now falls into the millennial or generation Z demographic. Um, and so that obviously brings with it um, the need to understand what that generation and what those generations actually feel, what they're thinking. And let me tell you, mental health is very high um, on their list of priorities. Just before I go into some of the findings that we had from our recent millennial survey, one thing that I also did want to just emphasize is I have a, I, I absolutely agree, and I think it's really, you know, a good thing that mental health is very high on the agenda of CEOs at the moment, and that's from from what I'm seeing, anything from large organisations to um to to SMEs as well. The one thing that does concern me slightly about that is that once we are through this pandemic, um, that it then takes a, a backseat again. Um, and, and, and what I am here to say is that um, mental health was, you know, very much an issue um, before COVID. And, and just to illustrate that, to give you some of the findings from, um, from our millennial survey. So, so we started the millennial survey um, end of last uh, calendar year. And before any of us could see what was going to hit us from a pandemic perspective, we then obviously as we started to get the results we were in the middle of um, the pandemic so we went out and we did a pulse survey um, as well and and so what we were able to do was get a snapshot of how the, the findings had changed so before um, the pandemic and during the pandemic now it's 18,000 millennials and generation z um, globally and this year is the first year that we had really included very detailed questions 
on mental health. And really, because it's such a priority for us as an organisation, we knew it needed to be a priority for others and therefore important that we had some detail. So just to give you a snapshot of the findings, because, you know, it, it, that, that sort of question around why should this be important for employers? Well, well, it should be because 48% of Generation Z and 44% of millennials basically told us that they feel anxious or stressed all or most of the time. I mean, that, that's just, just enormous. And actually with a higher proportion still among women and young parents. Now, very interesting, I talked about the Pulse thing, um, doing the Pulse survey during um, you know, the, the sort of first wave and, and stress levels actually fell slightly during COVID. So where we were all assuming that they were going to go up in that generation, they fell slightly. Now it was still a significant issue. Now, you could then say, well, possibly that's due to an increase in remote working and possibly a general slowdown in life. Um, now, nearly half of Generation Z and 44% of millennials ranked their mental health as their first or second priority in life, with only physical health ranking higher on that list of priorities. Now, there is a really wide list of stressors. And actually, I have to say, I... I <laughs> I agree. I'm a mother of um, two children. Um, I had all the homeschooling. I had everything else. And I have to say, I'm not a millennial, but I actually really agree with many of these. And, you know, things like family, concerns about family welfare, financial security, climate change, all of those things that, that you know, we worry about. But from a workplace perspective, interestingly, there were two top contributors to mental health challenges. The first one was balancing work and life. And Miranda referred to you know, flexible working and information around that. I believe that's critical for organisations to get that right and the positive impact on mental health. And then secondly, not feeling comfortable to be your authentic self at work. And that's rather depressing and frustrating when so many organisations have been focusing on diversity and inclusion for so long. And then just finally, before I, um, before I finish on my comments, the one thing I think that I would say depressed me most um, about the findings was that it's very clear that, that stigma is alive and well globally and, and within the workplace. And this really needs to change. I believe the workplace can play a critical role in changing that. So more than, while more than half of millennials and Generation Z felt that taking time off due to stress is actually legitimate, it's a good thing, and indeed a third had said they had done that themselves, about half of those that had taken time off for those reasons had given their employer a completely different reason. So it clearly shows that a lot more needs to be done. And, you know, I firmly believe that the workplace um, can play a critical, you know, a key role. Thank you very much, Emma. Um, do you want to say a little bit about what Deloitte does about stigma? <laughs> Oh, yes. And, you know, this is it. And, and let me tell you, we don't have all the answers. Um, I, and hence collaborations like the, um, you know, the, the initiative that we've been working on with, uh, like, you know, One Mind at Work, um, obviously, um, you know, very, very happy to be working with Welcome Trust as well with HSBC, with Unilever, um, you know, that, that together we have the answers in my view. And I think there are so many good practices out there. Now, now from our perspective, a big part of it has been talking about it and having leaders talk about it. And my previous role, before I assumed my global role, was I was managing part of talent in Deloitte UK. So 18,000 people, um, again, very large number of millennials there. And, and actually, when we looked in 2016, we took part in the Mind Index, fabulous Mind Index. And we, in 2016, one thing that, that came out starkly um, was that our people did not feel particularly comfortable talking um, about when they had periods of mental ill health and they also felt that their leaders weren't very equipped to actually deal with it if they did speak out. So for us, the solution was, you know, we, we did the This Is Me campaign. We got people talking about it. We had our CEO talking about it. I was talking about it. We introduced mental health champion, champions as well. So people that you could go to, all of those things. But I think it's talking about it. It's it's for want of a better word, normalizing it. It's making it part of the conversation. And then for me, the big issue is inclusive leadership and how people lead, because it's all very well having messaging that comes from the top that says, you know, you, please feel free to talk about this. It's okay to not be okay. And then you go to your line leader 
and your line leader does not demonstrate any sympathy, raises their eyebrows, makes you feel, um, you know, bad. So, so we've also focused really significantly on inclusive leadership and um, mental health first aid. So, so look, it's a combination of things and it takes time um, as well. But, but we've shown that it works and that slowly but surely, if you do the right things that work for you as a business, you can start to reduce stigma. Are the results of your survey available for sharing? Yes, absolutely. And if I can work out how to, if I can be as brilliant as Miranda and work out how to paste links, um, I will, <laughs> I'll find sure, a way to do <laughs> to Let's make do sure the world, the world Economic Forum team can make sure that happens. If, yeah. but, but do try, that'd be great. Yeah. Um, just a couple more questions, I guess. Um, I think you, you mentioned almost in passing that in the talk about it, anti-stigma approach, the leadership are taking part in that. Did I hear that correctly? Because that's yes. one of the common yeah. problems you find that the young staff then put themselves out there in talking about it. And in our own company, that certainly happened on our in intranet. Um, but the people at the very top who presumably have their own stress problems may not be quite so willing to do that. So let's get your experience about that. Yes. And, and you know, we've got great examples of that um, around the world. Australia, we have the most amazing, inspirational, very senior partner, um, you know, client facing um, within our organisation who we've actually just recorded a podcast. We release global podcasts um, and he has given the most extraordinary insight. I, I myself actually took um, three or four tips out of there that I then actually was passing to my children. I've got two 11 year olds. Um, starting a new secondary school, all of the stresses and trains, train. so actually being able to even take that and pass it on to others. But so it is, it's getting those role models. Um, our CEOs are very engaged, so our global CEO is very engaged in this, but absolutely it's finding those senior um, role models. Now, I'm not saying that was what happened first of all, I have to be honest, back in the UK when we started out on this, we had a lot of more junior people coming forward. And, but it, and it took a few months before we started getting the more senior ones. We have people like, you know, and, and also we have John Bins, who is a partner that talks very openly, does a lot of work um, for us globally as well, um, and is very open about, um, you know, his, his period of uh, mental health, what he does, how he stays mentally um, healthy, and, and all of that's so important um, for our people to hear. So... So, you know, it, it does take time. And, and I agree with you, Phil, it is the biggest challenge is getting senior individuals to come forward. But again, the more we talk about it, the more the CEO talks about it, the more it's clear it is a, it, a priority for us as a sustainable business. This is a sustainability issue. I think I've got one more uh, time for one more question for you. Um, <laughs> uh, but this is the subtopic of your breakout group, but it might be good to get a general message about it. And that's, uh, so I was involved in a previous WEF effort, the Global Agenda Council, where we did look at uh, the experience of companies at that time. This was a few years ago. And uh, talking to CEOs, it was clear that many who were already geared up to do things were doing it because they just thought it was the right thing to do. And it seemed to be less strong, the message, you need to do this as an investment. So the financial case seemed to weigh less heavily in the debate, if you like. So I'm just interested to get your experience about the importance of the, the moral leadership, as it were. But do we need to have the investment arguments there? We do. And, and look, with any change, you've got the moral duty um, the you know, the, the, the you know, our, with purpose led businesses, um, you know, the wider impact um, on our people and society. Absolutely. That's really important. But equally, I'm afraid I'm a realist and the business case is really important when we introduced um you know, agile working within when I was within the UK, that what part of my um, my method of moving a huge culture of presenteeism to one where you know it was far more around agile and work life balance was I came up with the number that we had on the table that was walking out of our door every year because we were getting it wrong, and eat the same goes from mental health um, perspective as well. So and and apologies, I have to glance at my notes here because there's there's some so Deloitte. We in the UK produced a report with Mind, um, and again we can put the link um, out there. Jan it was produced in January 2020, and it looked at um, the case for investment in, in mental health in the workplace. Now, now things like 
poor mental health cost UK employers up to 45 billion a year. Um, the report looked at return on investments. And I think this comes back to Miranda's point about, you know, what works, what doesn't work, evidence based. Now, it looked as best it could. And it was a fascinating piece of research. And what it found was that for every one pound um, spent by employers on mental health interventions, they get five pounds back in reduced absence, presenteeism and staff turnover. So, you know, things like early interventions, um, you know, really important, a greater return on investment. You know, we're businesses, so of course we're out there and of course, you know, we want to do good. Now, the final thing I would say is that I, I'm, I'm just practical about this. And look, I know myself, I know when I'm happy and when I'm engaged and when I'm able to be open, um, I'm so productive. But yeah. when I'm worrying about something and yeah. it's there and I'm displaying presenteeism when I'm going to work, do you know what, I'm rubbish. Thank and you. And so, you, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I just want a, 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 an apology and a confession here. There's a lot of chat going on and I'm not reading it because I'm concentrating on what I'm doing here. However, during the breakout sessions, I will check the chat and try and make sure we pick up on, uh, on the things. So now um, I'm handing on to our next panelist, Enoch. Enoch Lee, do tell us about mm. your interests, especially in the Asia Pacific region, but whatever you want, over to you. Thank you, and thank you for having me as part of this conversation. Um, I started this work because of my own experience 10 years ago in clinical depression, and I attempted suicide a few times. And at that point, I was working in a large corporate. And as time went on, as I made sense of my own mental health condition, I started to realize that I was one of those people who held the biases and stigma that we've been talking about of depression is weak, it made me a failure, I can't talk to my boss, they won't understand, no one will help me. And I think particularly from an Asian uh, upbringing context, and I grew up in Hong Kong where it's extremely, extremely competitive. Um, we don't really play, if we play, it's playing to win, it's a competition. So we're extremely achievement focused. So when depression hit me, it felt like everything I had achieved fell apart. And it was a case of just not knowing who I was anymore. And to add to that element where the family unit is very strong in Asia Pacific, it also felt like I brought a lot of shame to my family. And as I work with people here in China and Asia Pacific, like a lot of the, I think a big difference is sometimes when we feel these issues, the first people we go to would be family outside of Asia, whereas in Asia, family almost seems to be the last people that we would tell because of the potential embarrassment that we're bringing to not just the family's origin, but even to a few generations up and all the extended relatives. And as I started to get better, um, I also moved on to study organizational psychology and, and leadership development. I started to think or feel a gap between the workplace, what companies are talking about, what leadership is like and mental health. And slowly I merged this into um, our business today, which is very much prioritized also around the social impact and community awareness we're racing around mental health of how can we help companies understand that this is an important topic, one. And secondly, how can we help the individuals think and understand that this is an important topic to themselves? Because we are, um, perhaps compared to the UK, Canada and Australia, we're still very much at a stage where I would say we're nurturing the market of why bother? Why bother about mental health? Uh, why bother about it in the workplace? And even a question of, this is a private issue. Why, does it, why is my employer even implicated in this? Why would I share it with them? Um, and so our work is very much around helping companies here and it would be interesting I think 99% of our clients so far are multinationals with a presence in China or Asia Pacific and we help them implement some of their global mental well-being strategies and initiatives in locally so that it's adapted to as I think Miranda brought up the local the cultural sensitivities we're also working of course with workshops and training to increase the mental health knowledge and what we find is that the last few years where four or five years ago when I started working on this on my own, I remember knocking on a few companies doors and say, let me come and talk to you about mental health for free. I won't even charge you. And they said, no, thank you, but you can come and teach us how to be happy. Mm -hmm. And I really had to draw the line there of, you know, what, what is the message that we're, we're trying to bring 
to, to about two to three years ago when I decided to build a team was when I felt like there was a bit more interest, but the interest was still around stress management, resilience, to now slowly. I think with the um, catalyst of COVID for better or for worse, people are asking, well, what else is there about mental health? Um, but that said, that is that small portion of the multinational presence here. For the Chinese companies here, we're still very much at a stage of there is this thing called mental health. And then actually another segment that we work a lot with is startups and entrepreneurs, um, which I would group much more as our social impact work because most, most entrepreneurs at startup stage are quite bankrupt that they can't pay for any of this training. So we do talk to them about burnout. It's a very prevalent thing. I, I think there's a Stanford University study a few years ago that said entrepreneurs are 30% more likely than white collar workers to experience burnout, depression, anxiety, especially in the early stage. Um, and that's really one area I hope to change here in China. Um, if you look at some of the big Chinese tech companies, I don't know if anybody's heard of the culture called 996, which means the culture of um, equivalent in Silicon Valley of hustling. You work 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. six days a week at least. And that's a badge of honor. Um, and you also have senior leaders in these tech companies mandating employees to be in the office for at least nine hours. So that for me is the aspiration of that's what I would like to change someday. Um, and at the moment, we're working with those who are much more receptive to the idea. Thank you very much, Enoch. Um, I've got two questions uh, that sort of mm -hmm. relate to each other. One is, um, how can other people on this call help you? You've got a, you, I think I assume you've got an opportunity here, uh, given this audience and given the, the other speakers. So I'd be interested to hear to what extent others can help you in your view. And other, and also, um, if you look at sustainability more generally, in China there has been tremendous leadership um, from the government, and uh, and of course that happens both at the national level and at cities level, for example. Mm. So I'm interested to know how you might ever turn to the government to mm. impress on the need for Chinese companies and individuals for that matter to think about mental health as a, as a real issue and to avoid stigma or to mitigate it. Mm. I, I agree, maybe I'll answer your second question first. I agree the government has done a lot over the last, um, I think seven to eight years, particularly with the mental health plan that they have put in place of training more psychiatrists. And, and here is where it's interesting for me of they have trained psychiatrists, but they haven't quite trained what we would traditionally know as clinical psychologists, right? People who aren't medically trained, but are clinically trained to understand mental health conditions. Now, what that does is that only psychiatrists in China are allowed to diagnose any mental health conditions. And anyone who's not medically trained are called therapists. They are not allowed to diagnose, but they can do therapy. So what that creates is in some ways, yes, there is more help, but the idea of I have to go to a hospital to get a diagnosis doesn't quite help with the idea of the shame and embarrassment that we feel with, with stigma. And I think one of part of what we would hope to do as well, and I completely agree with the, um, the importance of lived experience, and, and I have another role actually on the Global Mental Health Peer Network where we're driving lived experience as a methodology to relate to people is to help them destigmatize this, right? But there is a big disconnect with healthcare in um, the national level and community level. And where I'm working at is the private sector. Um, and I think part of working in the private sector in some ways politically, I'm also under the radar in case I do something that's not quite uh, within a certain line. So there is, there is those things that we're treading here over where, you know, is this line do I cross when I, when I work on mental health, right? So I'm also quite careful and respectful in that sense. And I would love one day to be working and advocating much more with the government. At the, at the moment, we're still working much more with the universities here. Um, helping them with some research. But I think that connect where I see and quite envious of, of in the UK of the work between the government and the private sector and the civil society all coming together. I think we're still very early stage here in China. And so that leads me to answering your second question of the help I would love is um, if any of you have companies or um, with presence in Asia Pacific and China, I'd love to get connected to them. 
um, not just from a business standpoint, but from a standpoint of can we get together collectively and do something that we see happening in the UK, like the GBI? You know, can can we come together? Because a lot of these multinationals also have a presence in China. Um, I'm seeing a lot of campaigns run outside of Asia Pacific, um, and I'm like, well, these are global names. What's happening with the counterparties here in Asia? Is the regional headquarters of some of these companies in Hong Kong and Singapore, are they aware of it? What about the China head? And if they are, can we get connected? Can we build that presence here in China and run something here that is also in the Chinese language, um, in terminology that we would understand and also give some guidance in that, in that sense? That's great. Maybe the World Economic Forum can help people get access to you if you're willing to share your contact details. I would love to. Put it on the chat. That'd be great. I believe that Fatima Azara El Azuzi has joined the session. Uh, Can I have that confirmed? Because if so, Fatima, welcome. Ah, there you are. Great. A a, a warm welcome to you. And uh, I did introduce you earlier on in your absence in the hope that you could join us. So now I'm just gonna hand over to you, Fatima. This is your chance to say whatever it is you would like to say to this group. Thank you so much. Um, and thank you to all the panelists. Uh, so me uh, joining late is a, a result of time zone confusion because I'm actually dealing with a um, difficult mental health period myself. So I've been, uh, this has been quite happening to me more and more than, uh, more than one time. Um, and I think we just need to be vulnerable about these things when they happen, not be ashamed of it. Um, so, you know, a lot of important insights and I, and I second, um, you know, all the ideas that, that have come up. Um, I think uh, the word shame that, that, you know, mentioned is, is very important here. And, uh, you know, as uh, Dr. Brené Brown says, the, the antidote to shame is empathy and, and compassion. And I think we are not there yet in the workplace. Um, I think as much as the pandemic has, um, you know, had a silver lining of, you know, allowing the words mental health to not be shameful to talk about, um, I feel like, um, you know, we're talking about mental health as a corporate concept or a product, uh, which it is not. Um, When we talk about mental health, we talk about human feelings and emotions. And I think we need to um, humanize mental health more, especially in the workplace. And, um, you know, just talk more vulnerably about what that means. And and, um, again, I uh, fully agree with, you know, um, Emma when she she talks about senior leadership being involved and CEOs and heads of companies, Um, especially when we see that younger people uh, who are, you know, less powerful in uh, the the workplace, uh, most of the time are not okay, they do not feel safe to talk about their mental health issues. And and if we don't change that, if we don't have a culture of trust where people feel empowered to talk about these things and that their feelings are going to be valued, we're not going to change anything. We could have as many services and you know, initiatives and Miranda, you know, mentioned a a lot of solutions that we can come up with. But um, this is one area where I believe in a top down approach, because if I go to my manager and I talk about, you know, uh, the issues of, you know, mental illness that my mom is dealing uh, with that that are, you know, impacting my my work life and she doesn't understand that, uh, you know, that's not going to help. But if you have CEOs of companies and, and senior leadership who come and vulnerably tell their stories, and I do think there is a difference here, you know, there's a difference between coming and saying well 10 years ago you know I'm a CEO and 10 years ago I dealt with depression and it was really hard and then I saw a therapist and it was okay Um, I think we need to start talking more about what's currently happening as it's happening I think we talk about it as a success story like oh it happened before and you know what like I'm on the other end of the spectrum and everything is okay but I think if someone, if, if you know, the, the leadership can come and say, I am currently struggling and, and this is exactly what's happening to me and maybe cry about it in front of employees. You know, how many CEOs have we seen cry in front of their employees about mental health? If we don't see things like that, I don't believe we can change the culture. So I believe mental health is about you know, um, you know, grief of, of losing a job, for example, a lot of people have been laid off and, and the way we talk about it is very important. Uh, it's about, um, you know, dealing with, with parents or grandparents who are, who have dementia and it's like, you really don't know how to deal with them. It's about having kids, you know, Emma shared her, you know, motherhood story, you know, having kids that you have to school at home and, and literally like practically what it means to deal with that uh, and how it impacts your work and how you can't focus and how you can't be as, uh, you know, 
know, performing. Um, I do think we need to be a little bit more honest um, and especially coming from, from the senior leadership. Um, another thing that I wanted to mention is um, diversity and inclusion, which is a dear area to, to my heart and making sure that when we offer those services, we make sure that people have equal access. We're probably talking now about multinational companies, you know, and a lot of them during the pandemic, they came up with services and like free counseling hours for employees and so on. But I think we need to think more about smaller structures in, um, especially in, you know, um, countries or cultures where the stigma is higher. I come from Morocco and in Africa, uh, it's not as, as easy. I mean, we're, we're, we have improved so much, but, but it's not as easy to talk about these topics. So maybe how we can be more creative and, you know, partner with spiritual or religious organizations with companies. You know, there's so many different things that can be done. Fatima, thank you so much. I just want to ask you one question. We're, we're getting to the end of the session, but um, your work as a global shaper, it might be interesting to just hear very briefly about points of inspiration from that. You know, are there places in the, the region that you're dealing with, the networks that you're dealing with, that, that can provide inspiration and that can be shared uh, with the participants on this call with the help of the World Economic Forum? Yes, so I mean, I'm very proud of the work we've done as a global shapers community over the past three or four years. Um, you know, four years ago, we had no mental health projects in uh, practically in, in uh, the, the projects that we do locally in our hubs. Uh, but now we're just so overwhelmed. I, I no longer know, you know, uh, all uh, about all the projects that, that we have in every speak in every every country around the world. And we started that by getting vulnerable and by talking about it in smaller groups and saying, what can we do about this? Well, there's stigma. Okay, let's break the stigma. So in 2018, we uh, organized the campaign on social media and allowed people to tell their stories and, and the videos are still available. So you could see a man in Canada and a woman in Nigeria talking about, you know, depression and anxiety and maybe suicide attempts and seeing that they're telling the same story. So we realized how much of a global uh, issue this is. Is. And, and right now, the big projects we're working on is um, um, having um, a training for uh, people. Really, our goal is to offer it for people all around the world around being an empathic listener, because we believe this is at the heart of improving mental health. A final question, very briefly. Is, is what you've learned there, to what extent is it shareable? To what extent is there documentation that you could share with us? Uh, yes, so um, we're working on a website for the um, training that, that we're offering and we're planning also to offer it as an online course. So stay tuned. This is coming in the next That's couple great. of months and we'll be able to share it through the forum. Thank you so much, Fatima. Um, so everybody, thank you very much for your contributions. Um, I found that actually really positive and inspiring, I have to say, despite the enormity of the challenges. 